Ed Sullivan show? Yeah. Oh, the yeah. Christmas edition, they had the little monkeys that played yeah. the drums. Mm -hmm. Those were mine. <coughs> My father produced the Ed Sullivan show. He did? And every really? Christmas he took those in and the little monkeys played the drums. I'm surprised we have that. Do you have any at home? I don't have them anymore. Really? I don't know. The last time he used them, he didn't bring them home. Oh, wow. But those were mine. Oh, my God, that's so cool. You're so, famous. Yeah. <laughs> so, toys. Who plays with toys? We do. Yeah. And puppies and dogs and kittens and cats and horses. Yes. Horses love to play with toys. And elephants. Yes, yeah, elephants. Mm -hmm. So, I know we've all had the experience of uh, giving a child a toy and they go nuts over the box. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but since the dawn of time, people have played with toys. People more coordinated than I am. At first, toys were all homemade. You uh, just put together stuff and hope to God it worked. Yay! But you'd be surprised when things got organized, and I'm going to tell you about that. The purpose of toys is they help with eye-hand coordination, they increase your educational knowledge, they make you laugh, and they don't have to be really expensive. You can just make a toy out of anything you can get your hands on, yeah. Yeah. And it makes a nice, happy noise yes. and doesn't really cost much. <coughs> Especially if you use your own buttons. It occupies your fingers when you're watching it TV. And yeah, it does. It does. Yeah. And kids will play with anything mm -hmm. yeah. uh, because they need to play. They need to develop their coordinations. Toys reflect the current technology. In ancient Egypt, they had rocks with people's faces on them. This, by the way, is Spock the Rock. It is an official pet rock. <laughs> and then they have things that reflect the current technologies. That's Grogu, Baby Yoda. <laughs> Drives my dogs nuts. <laughs> the first toys were rattle of woven straw, clay, silver, leather, and wood. 4,000 BCE, in Egypt, they played with stone and glass marbles. Ancient Romans used pig's bladders as a form of football. Uh, ancient Egyptian, Greek, and Roman kids had dolls with jointed limbs, spinning tops, balls, and pull-along animals on wheels. They played bowling games, rolled hoops, did leapfrog and tag, and chasing games. Roman children played with single room settings of shops and kitchens, little doll houses. Uh, ancient Egypt had paddle dolls painted to look like women rather than children. They had changeable clothes. Greek toddlers pushed a haymax. It's a toy on a long stick. The one we have at the museum is a little guy riding a bicycle. Okay, yeah. Uh, the ones the ancient Greeks had were a chime bar. <coughs> And they pushed it, and the chimes oh, played. Yeah. <laughs> you want to see one? Come to the museum. Uh, sorry about this next bit, but truth is truth. Roman children played with bouncing balls made from cat gut. And that's exactly what it was made out of. It was bouncy, like a rubber band ball. <laughs> Greek children had a marionette that danced on a board. Like that idea. There's you pounded on it and it danced away. But this is another form, and these have been around for centuries. Phoenicians traded toys around the Mediterranean 1000 BCE, mostly miniatures of real items. In 200 BCE, Hero of Alexandria made moving birds and figures using hydraulics and pneumatic power. Pneumatic powder is when you get wind. <laughs> and hydraulics, you would pour a cup of water in the top of the toy, and it would come down and turn the wheels and the gears, and the little creatures would flap their wings or walk a few steps, all with just a little bit of water. And he did that 2,000 years before it's James Watt developed the steam engine. In the year 1000, 
Arabian kids were playing with toy birds that had flapping wings and model peacocks that walked and had, and they were also dancing men, all with water power. The growing toy industry in England around 1200 had pewter, bronze, and brass molded into miniatures, like uh, miniature castles, all molded up that the kids could play with. In 13th century Nuremberg, merchants sold artisan-made dolls, marionettes, whirly gates, and spinning hoops. Today, the largest and most influential toy fair in the world is from Nuremberg. Many fairs in the Middle Ages had puppet shows. Java and Bali had elaborate shadow puppet shows. If you've seen the last Harry Potter film, there is a magnificent shadow puppet feature where you can just see the shadows of these jointed creatures moving around to tell the story. And they did that a thousand years ago. Hobby horses and model knights became familiar, and some of them worked on this principle. <coughs> From 17th to early 20th century, Puritan and fundamentalist children could only play with Bible-themed uh, toys on Sunday, like Noah's Ark. <laughs> and uh, in 1760, there were teaching kids how to draw maps and to make sure the kids understood what they had drawn. They made it and they cut it into pieces and had to put it back together, which gave us the jigsaw, jigsaw puzzle. Um, this is just an overview. We're going to be more specific later. The educational toy movement started about 300 years ago. In 18th century, they had automata, moving dolls and animals that caused a fierce philosophical debate. You are trying to create life just by winding up clockwork. And they made these almost a thousand years ago. <laughs> and of course it makes sparks which is so much safer than anything else you want to do. <laughs> you can stop now. <laughs> People had the philosophical debate, you are trying to create life. What is wrong with you? And some places they're illegal. Bellows and valves operated elaborate creatures, and they used clockwork to make mark walking figures. Bowling games existed since 5200 BCE. Bowling was very popular in 14th and 15th century Europe. And the Dutch brought nine-pin bowling over to America. Now, Connecticut and Massachusetts were both Puritan. And they said, you can't do that, that's fun. So they outlawed nine-pin bowling. So the people added another pin, but had ten-pin bowling. And the legislature said, we're just going to outlaw ten-pin bowling. We'll add another pin. The legislature gave up. It never occurred to them to outlaw bowling. <laughs> <laughs> this is how our government functions. <laughs> In the 1840s, the most popular toys were metal, metal, clockwork wind-up figures, jumping clowns, trains, ships, waddling ducks, and tin toys brought to us by Germans. I don't have any of those tin toys. They're all worth a fortune. The trains came through Auburn in 1839. And as soon as the kids saw the train wheels, oh, train wheels, that looks like fun to play with. So somebody invented the wheel -o, which used to be a lot longer, at least I think they were. Yeah, your arms are shorter. Uh, in 1857, Britain made a modern bouncing ball made of rubber. This is just after Goodyear discovered vulcanization. In 1892, toys were so popular, somebody wrote a two-act ballet all around toys. And that was the Nutcracker. Nutcracker. You're good. <laughs> <laughs> they, they'll debate that. <laughs> as soon as a major invention was made in the adult world, somebody would hurry to turn it into a toy. The three, I think most, well, the gears moving the trains, caulk for tile, was made into silly putty. And they used the same stuff, they modified it a little to get the stains off of wallpaper. That turned into Play-Doh. 
the three most popular things were Caltrops, the Wire Helix Wave Demonstrator, and of course the European Garot. They all screamed to be made into toys. Now Caltrops are made by blacksmiths and they can be this big or they can be this big, teeny teeny. But the blacksmith had to make them so they cost money. So after the battle they would send kids in and for every two or three Caltrops you pick up I'll give you a penny. Well you know how kids are, they got bored. I can pick, I'm going to throw the stone in the air and I can pick up two Caltrops. I'm going to throw the stone in the air and I can pick up three Caltrops. <laughs> the Wire Helix Wave Demonstrator was used from the early 1800s to show sound waves and light waves. And they were not that complex to make, but they really showed sound <coughs> waves and light waves in the universities. Well, of course, the kids would get their hands on them. And there you go with the slinky. And, of course, somebody probably dropped them at the top of a flight of stairs. And there you were. The other toy that really screamed, the other thing that, how could you not make a toy of it, is the European garage. It's razor wire with a handle wound around a stone. And if you were good, you could see your victim going by and throw it in such a way and pull it that the guy's head came off. <laughs> now, does that not to you scream kid's toy? Yeah. yeah. I should think so. <laughs> That's it's amazing. The, of the soccer ball. <laughs> yeah. I mean, what else would you do with it? Oh, yo, but make yo. a toy out of it. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The yo-yo. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I can see somebody witnessing. It can't be a victim. Witnessing... <laughs> Somebody using the garage. Whoa, toy, great idea. I gotta get one. Until unless he sees me first. <laughs> now, in eighteen ninety they got rubber type that you moved around with tweezers and put in a little wooden frame and inked it. Mm -hmm. I had that, I made a little neighborhood newspaper. Um, an early book on floor games, Marvels, Push Toys, Clockwork Toys was written by H.G. Wells. He later found other things to write about. In 1902, a working toy submarine came from Germany. In the 1950s, Cannon Rubber made multicolor rubber buckets, spades, and rakes with the leftover rubber from the thing they made to make a living, hot water bottles. Frederick Froebel, in the early 1800s, made blocks in basic geometric shapes. Kids would play and learn basic fundamentals of geometry and discover how nature worked. If you pile them up, they fall over. They became a great commercial success. Uh, he made them out of wood. Until Richter's anchor blocks came in 1878. They were made from molded cement. I don't know about you, but I know I occasionally threw blocks at people. <laughs> Wouldn't you just love to have your children flinging molded cement around? <laughs> they, uh, they could only fit in the box one way. It was, the instructions were very complicated. Maria Montessori believed in the fundamental importance of childhood as a distinct time of exploration and learning. You need simple toys that would not inhibit the imagination. Now, construction toys, you were talking about those earlier. Not until after 1900, including professionally made blocks. This was inspired by the massive increase in construction in England after World War I because so much stuff got flattened. Frank Hornby wanted to entertain a relative's children. He saw a crane at a local lumberyard. In 1901, Meccano, sold in America as an erector set. He invented that trying to figure out a toy for his neighbors. Uh, marketed to boys in the belief they should understand basic mechanics and engineering. There were mechanical clubs, there were mechanical magazines. In 1915, he made a clockwork train and electric motor. In 1920, Hornby decided to make the Hornby train, old gauge trains. 1933, he made dinky toys. <coughs> now, the last dinky toy I think made, and I had it and I got rid of it in the yard sale. Oh. and I wish I hadn't, was a USS Enterprise that actually shot little discs. Oh, wow. 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 <clears throat> now, 
1914, the Tinker Toys came out, created by Charles Pajot from Evanston, Illinois, who was a stonemason. But, you know, the stonemasons have to have wooden forms. And he was looking at all the scraps, and they had the discs with little holes in them, and they had sticks, and went, ooh, whoa. Yeah, I can sell this. In 1916, there was a fellow who loved the stories of Laura Ingalls Wilder, and he wanted to make a building toy. So he thought of a way to fit logs together, and he was a big fan of a certain president, so he invented... Lincoln Logs. The fellow who did this was John Lloyd Wright, Frank's kid. He explored the possibility for interlocking toy bricks in 1933. He had an enormous reputation as a toy maker. He was almost as famous as his father when he was alive. In 1930, Charles Plimpton of Liverpool created Bale Construction System from Bakelite. That's what they used to make bones out of. You know, you leave it in the sun and it turns all brittle. It used metal rods through bricks, and then you put the bricks on it. Don't you want your children playing with sharp metal rods? <laughs> it was on its way to being wildly popular until 1937 when the Primo Rubber Company in Hampshire made interlocking rubber bricks, min bricks. And that was on its way to being wildly popular until 1940. In 1932, Ole Kirk Christensen in Denmark was making wooden toys and animals on wheels. He began to make wooden bricks called play well in Danish, the same word meant I put together in Latin. In the 1940s, he used his idea but put them into polystyrene. Legos. By 1950, all over the world, Legos. Every other building toy was marketed to boys. Legos were marketed to girls and boys. That was a first. Then came the add-on sets, the Duplos, the little hands and all the stuff. I must have eight Lego sets at home I haven't played with yet. <laughs> and while they were doing this, they had the miniature toys. And one of the miniature toys they had in England were miniature rifles that actually fired pewter pellets. You want to put those in your house? <laughs> I mean, none of this would be, it's just dolls. Dolls have been made of wax, wood, or linen, sticks wound with fabric, pewter bone wool, loofah, wooden spoons, pegs, cloth, old shoes, dried leaves or grasses, clay, ivory, paper mache, porcelain, plastic, and corn stalks. <clears throat> now, when I was a kid, I had a whole set of clothespin dolls. And you got the kit, and it was a good sized clothespin with a round top. And you put these uh, stickers on them, and you turned them into sailors and soldiers and pirates and Indians. We just don't my mother's clothespins. That, 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 <laughs> well, my stepmother wouldn't have allowed me to do that. <laughs> Dolls were made in Sudan and Angola in the 19th century that looked just like the ones made 4,000 years earlier, and some made not. In the 19th century, they did flat, cut-out paper dolls with a wardrobe of clothes placed over the body and hung from the shoulder with tabs. This was to show you the latest Paris fashion. Women would get the base paper doll and paint their own faces on them, and then go through the book of French fashions and put the fashion on the doll that looked like them to decide what they wanted to order. Just on calls, wasn't it? The patterns? Yeah. You, you get them every month in the McCall's magazine? Yeah, things like that, yeah. In 1796, dolls were sent from England to New York City showing the latest fashions. The dolls were dressed elegantly, and after the season was over, they were given as gifts to friends. The first doll to say Mama and Papa was in 1824 in Paris. It was a little bellows inside that if you tried really hard to imagine it, it sounded like mama and papa. Mm -hmm. In 1875, an automated crawling baby doll from Nuremberg. And uh, shortly after that, there was a small a doll with a small phonograph put into it that had a recording of a child crying or talking by Edison. 
1862, a walking doll by a clockwork. In 1880, the domestic sewing machine's invention leads to mass-produced doll clothes. And the kids' sewing machines, you could make your own, and they had patterns in the magazines. This is for full size, and this is how you cut it down for a doll. In 1901, jointed waist dolls became common in Philadelphia. In 1910, all the joints were movable. The limbs of the doll were connected to the body by rubber cords attached to hooks on celluloid discs and joints. I don't know about you, but I spent hours trying to get the damn doll's arm back on the yeah, body and snag that. that little... Yeah, I remember that. Yeah. Oh, they came off so easily. <laughs> Uh, celluloid plastic, very stiff, was developed in Britain in the mid-1800s. In 1912, Rosie O'Neill used it to make Cupid dolls that you would win at carnivals and stuff. In 1915, John Gruel redesigned a tatty rag doll for his daughter, Marcella. Inspired by James Whitcomb Riley's The Story of the Raggedy Man, he invented Raggedy, Raggedy Ann. Ann. Andy, Andy. And Andy. In 1929, the modern concept of fashion dolls to display clothes elegantly was used by the French, cheaper than models. Uh, Nathan Goodyear, the brother of Charles, tried to make an unbreakable rubber doll. It was only popular with dogs. I mean, it was hard, it was, wouldn't move, it was, yeah, no. In 1934, a Hungarian rubber goods factory made hollow dolls with a whistle in the middle that squeaked and it was squeezed. Guess who wanted those? The dogs. <laughs> a thinner, improved celluloid, very stiff polystyrene, came in after World War II. It was cheaper, and you could do the jointed dolls more easily. 1959, Ruth Handler, one of the founders of the Mattel Toy Company, wanted a doll for her teenage daughter, developed a doll conveying sophistication and confidence in her posture. What was the name of the daughter? Oh, Barbie. Barbie. The daughter's name was Barbara. She invented, now the Barbie doll was the very first doll to have stuff. Most of the other dolls came the way they were. If you wanted more clothes, you made them yourself. Barbie came with stuff. She came with clothes, and shoes, and handbags, and a car, and a house, and a this, and a that. In 1980, the first black Barbie. Barbie is now available in 150 countries, and the company says that every second, two Barbie dolls are sold somewhere in the world. And maybe more, wow. because there's a, going to be a movie coming out with Yeah, they're going to do a Barbie movie. There is? Yeah. Oh. Now, in the early 60s, G.I. Joe in the U.S., action man in Britain, action figures. Girls play with dolls. Boys play with action figures. They both have stuff. They both can be dressed up. They both have cars and boats but action figures and dolls. <laughs> Doll houses. In 1581, there were very elaborate models of fancy houses, usually in a big cabinet, and you could, and you could turn the cabinet around to see the front and in the back. They were made to show kids, rich kids, how to run a household. What goes in what room, what goes together, how to decorate how to plan for things. Um, more restrained houses were found in 1673. In the 17th century, doll houses appeared in Germany. Before that, it was one single room to show off furniture and middle and miniatures. But when they started going in the entire doll houses, oh. then you could have the miniature furniture and they had plumbing and they had electricity and they came very fancy and expensive. But in 1911, Germans began making flat-packed replica buildings that unfolded to be a dollhouse. And that's, of course, been adapted many times over. I'm sure many of us have gotten these cards. And you just pooch it, and there you are. Uh, they were very popular in the U.S., a series of grand houses named after U.S. presidents. In 1940, Sunnybrook Farm was made from fiberboard. It had a wooden tractor with rubber wheels. 
Then there was the Pillsbury Play Bakery, cut out paper sheets assembled into a complete production line of Pillsbury products. You could even turn a little crank and the little conveyor belt would go around. All made out of paper. Stuffed animals. Stuffed animals, of course, originally were stuffed with sawdust. They were often made out of some sort of canvas, and they smelled to high heaven, and there was no way in God's green earth to clean them. Um, very few, of course, have survived. And the stuffed animal really depended on where you were getting them from. I mean, there's Chinese dragons. English dragons. Come on, son. American dragon. It's big. That's Simon. So, none of them, these are, I think they're washable, but I don't think I'd try it. Um, with the increase of padded furniture, the dolls got, so the animals got softer. They were stuffed with straw, horse hair, shavings, sawdust. The fur wore off, and I'm sure you had some of the teddy bear, the eye came out and there was a spike on it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> or you could screw it back in. And if it wore too thin, there'd be a big wire sticking out. Um, it just wasn't the way you wanted it. And I have more stories about stuffed animals. But the way we have done things, the bigger the better. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. Those, those, those. I don't remember that. That's fairly recent. Fairly recent. There's a bigger one, too. Oh, yeah. Huh. But it all depends on there being somebody who has an idea. Somebody who has a concept. And this brings us, I do 75 to 100 talks. And this is my favorite story. It is wildly wildly politically incorrect. <laughs> this is the story of the burden on the family and the useless nephew. The burden on the family was born July 24, 1947 in Germany. She had polio when she was little. By the time it was all over, all she could move was her left arm. She could not walk. Her right arm was basically a weight. Her parents, well, she's going to be a burden on the family, but we love her. And uh, they did their best with her, and they said, well, honey, we'll keep you home. No, I want to go to school. Oh, dear, they'll make, I want to go to school. The kid had the gift of being able to convince people whenever she said something. School. So the parents said, all right, and sent her off to school. Now, school in the 1850s for girls was reading, writing, arithmetic, and sewing. So Burden figured out how to turn the sewing machine around, use her right arm as a weight, and sew with her left arm. And she actually got to be pretty good. She could sew with her hand and with the machine. So when she finished school, she said, I want to make a living as a seamstress. And Father, who owned a construction company, had money coming out of his ears. I mean, all the guys in his family, except for one, worked in construction. But she wanted, okay, Burden, dear, here you can have this room in the first floor and you can be a seamstress. And Burden was happy. So Burden had a friend coming up who was having a birthday. Now by this time, many other polio victims had gone to school because of her. And she had several friends who were helping her with their seamstress work. She wanted to make a, a gift for her friend. So, enter Useless Nephew. Everybody in the family was in construction except Useless who went to art school in Stuttgart. He wanted to be an artist. So they said, okay, useless, you look after Burden. Whatever she wants, you get it for her. So she said, useless dear, go to the zoo and get a picture of that brand new elephant thing they've got. Make me a picture. So he came back with his idea of an elephant. She made a pin cushion. Pause to be sure everyone knows what a pin cushion is. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> uh, in the shape of an elephant and gave it to her friend. Her friend went nuts. This is glorious. And all of a sudden, the friend's friends. And she would make it a couple of hundred elephants. So she sent Burden off to the zoo and said, can, uh, you know, okay, monkeys, donkeys, horses, pigs, and camels. And some one of the nephews was selling them at a country fair. So Burden said, 
yeah, this is, yeah, 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 yeah. So her father was in his study with his family friend named Glass, the sort of friend you'd call uncle. And she went in, well, actually in six years, she made 5,000 of these little elephants, camels, and whatnot. So she went into the study and said, Father, I want you to rent me a factory. I want to get into big time. I have a lot of friends who are handicapped. We're all going to get together and make animals. And Father said, you are a woman. You are disabled. And running a business is not a woman's job. Uncle Glatz, 60-40. 70-30. And they finally decided on an equal distribution, and Glatz rented her the factory. And she employed all of her friends. She said to her father, my determination will help me leap over these obstacles. You wait and see, Papa. She opened the factory in 1886 and gave jobs to many disabled people. Everything was going really fairly well. She helped invent a new fabric, mohair. And she stuffed it with cotton batting. The toys were washable. Big selling point. So in 19, she was doing really well. I mean, you know, on a slower scale. Until 1902, when Teddy Roosevelt refused to shoot a baby bear. And there was an engraving of that in every newspaper in the world. Everybody looked and said, oh. Burden looked at it and said, gold mine. And they started making bears. Burden was one of the first to make new using mohair, and the nephew drew a design with an endearing facial expression. The bear debuted at the Leipzig to Toy Store, so Leipzig Toy Fair. That's not easy. The Leipzig Toy Fair in 1903. It got a little bit of attention, but the Americans bought all 100 of the bears and ordered another 3,000. So the bears were then exhibited at the Great St. Louis World's Fair in 1904 and won the gold medal as the finest toy made. By this time, Burden was being called the toy woman. She sold 12,000 bears. In 1908, the factory was selling 1 million bears a year. The company had a motto, which is only the best is good enough for children. The nephew went on to design a roller plane, a kite that could take aerial pictures. And I have some pictures, by the way, this is useless. This is an early picture of Burden. Notice that you don't see anything. She's sitting in a chair. After Burden opened her factory, this is Burden. Yeah, I'm in a wheelchair. What do you want to make of it? Uh, this is the factory that used this design. It was the first factory to use all natural light. And what else do we have? And this is a terrible picture, but you can kind of see it's all women in wheelchairs sitting there making them. She was actually the largest employer of handicapped women uh, in the world, which is an impressive thing. So everything was going along really well until one of the, oh, I forgot to tell you, in 1898 there was a worldwide depression so the bottom fell out of the construction business, so by 1903, Burden's entire family was working for her. <laughs> I'm sure she didn't go. <laughs> uh, problem. Somebody was counterfeiting the bears. They weren't using mohair. They weren't using the finest cotton batting. One of the nephews came and said, Auntie Burden, Auntie Burden, Auntie Burden, they're counterfeiting the bears. What are we going to do? Help us. Well, somebody came up with what they should do. Anybody got a guess? It was the ear, yep. ear buttons. They put a button in the ear of every creature that came from the factory of Marguerite Steiff, the greatest toy maker who ever lived, who couldn't walk and who had only used the one arm. So that's an original. And the Steiff factory is still in production today. Uh, she did sell it. I mean... The polio did cause other problems. Um, she died of pneumonia May 9th, 1908. She had sold the factory for multi-millions. She was one of the richest women in Germany. Which just tells you, don't count somebody out. 
just because they might be a burden on the family. Richard, Richard Carter, Richard Stuff, useless, died March 30th, 1939. He had moved to America. He was a famous inventor, an entrepreneur, an architect. Money coming out of his ears. So in the beginning, common items became toys. And now, toys are becoming real. DNA models. Oh, cool. You play with it. The fellow worked for Motorola was an enormous Star Trek fan. The Star Trek communicator oh, yeah. became the flip phone. <laughs> In all the science fiction movies, you got the robots. Now we really have robots. You saw the Super Bowl commercial with the robots serving beer? Mm -hmm. yeah. They do other things too. So we go from Reality to fantasy, and from fantasy to reality, all because we want something to play with. And I hope you like that. Yeah, that is what I have to tell you. Does anybody have any questions? I have some comments. Okay. Um, good old Mr. Potato Head. Oh, yeah, yeah. Mr. Potato Head. And I can remember having to use a real potato, oh, I that. And, oh, yes. the, and the pieces mm -hmm. had like really big, sharp nails on yes, the bottom. Yes. And then they went into styrofoam, and then they went into plastic. Yeah, it's not the same. Yeah, I use a real potato yeah. from Mr. Yep. Potato Head. Yeah. And then my first step would come and grab it and say, that's for dinner. <laughs> <laughs> and she used it. <laughs> but, yeah. yeah, there's a lot of cool, and I don't have all the toys in the world. But you're welcome to come and look at them and play with them. And, uh... Bubble stuff, that was good. Bubble stuff. Yeah, I mean, you can do anything you want. Now they market... Silly putty is a tension reliever. Yeah. Yes. Now, this is right. scented. This is lavender scented. Yeah, that's right. And you can just squish it until you feel better. Yeah. And throw it at people. I try not to do that. <laughs> I pay good money for this. I'm not throwing it. <laughs> Years ago, we went to a museum up on, you know, on the North Shore, and they had a display of all the fashion dolls, and they were exquisite. Oh, some of them were really wonderful. Oh, they wonderful. were really fantastic they, they spared no expense on those fashion dolls. And yeah. then they sold them once the items were gone. When we were growing up, I had these wood blocks with numbers and letters on yep. them. That was a big toy, I guess, for that time. For the giving tree at church one year, it said alphabet blocks. I said, I had those. That must be easy. I'll get some alphabet blocks. You try finding wooden alphabet yeah, blocks these know. days. Well, I, I had to go them. like six places before I could find them. Oh. But yeah, I had them too. How about slingshots? <coughs> oh yeah, they're weapons. Yeah. They became <laughs> toys. Yeah. And are illegal in Massachusetts. Oh, they are? Oh yeah. You can't oh, play with a slingshot here. Oh, oh shucks. <laughs> <laughs> I, I assume you don't have one. I do. I do. Is it a locker? You, you, uh, you don't have one in the sense that we don't have an Auburn High band uniform because they all have to be returned, so obviously we don't have one in the corner by the high school cabinet. So you don't have a slingshot in that same sense of <laughs> sticking with the law. <laughs> Anybody, any other questions? What is that? What? Oh, it looks like a dog. Is it a robot? This? Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's a, that's a canine from Doctor Who. Oh. oh and it rolls. Okay. It kind of looks like something from um, the Jetsons. No, this is uh, from Doctor Who. Who. Right. And that's a mint and box Doctor Who. Mm -hmm. It's mine. Mm -hmm. So, and all these are mine. Most of them live in a box when I'm not giving the talk, but some of them yeah. fail. Yes. What is that thing that looks like a, um, an awl with ears? No, no, in front of the pink. It's a broomstick oh. for Harry Potter to fly on. Ah, oh. 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 It's a little letter opener. <laughs> what about the thing in the back with the little beads on it? This? Yeah, what's that? Oh, that's a neato magic loops. You play with it and they make all sorts of different shapes oh, and squish it. 
I had one of these when I was a kid. I oh, I swear it was bigger, but that's cool. Sort of like the house we had on the Cape it was a little cottage, mm -hmm. and I walked by it last month, and it's really small. I thought it was pretty big. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was there when I was like six years old, yeah. and big then. until I was like twelve, and it seemed like a big house. But I went by <laughs> and said, "No, not a big house." <laughs> But yeah, and the Rubik's Cube I bought mail order from Erno Rubik, and it has never been sold. Mm. And probably never will be. How about popsicle sticks? Popsicle like sticks are great. Of popsicle sticks. Yeah, you make rafts yeah. and float them in the ocean and they fall apart. You put a little toy on them and you never see it again. No personal experience there. And you can make birdhouses out of them if you glue it down. If you don't glue it down, then all you find are the sticks in the yard and a bunch of angry birds. No personal experience with that. Marbles? I make marbles now. Yeah, I used to have some marbles, but they disappeared after one of the talks. Very collectible. Marbles that were made out of stone, wood, glass. and glass. I make glass ones myself. And clay, yeah, they make clay marbles. I make glass marbles that are not completely round, but I think it's arbitrary to have them be all round. When my glass teacher kept saying, you want that to be round. And I said, there's a newspaper article here that says round is overrated. And she said, they're quoting you. No, <laughs> no it's in print, so it must be. <laughs> now the yo-yo from the 1940s. Ooh, European garage, cool. Yeah. Yeah, yo-yos are fun. They come and these light up. But the ones I had when I was a kid just said Duncan on them and didn't. Yeah. 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 But again, if you want to come and have a look at anything before I pack up, let me know. Thank you. Thank you. Pleasure. This great. This is great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Are you taking the summer off? And I bought this for those of you who like Harry Potter. At King's Cross Station at platform nine and three quarters on September the first, five years ago. Oh, I did. I did take some